Hello, my name is Terry Sutherland and I'm here with my C4 colleague Giacomo and this afternoon we're going to be talking about the integration of uh, landscape approaches and climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. So Giacomo, you work primarily um, on the interface between climate change mitigation and adaptation. Where do you see that interface with the work that we're doing on landscape approaches? Yes, uh, for me, uh, we are working on adaptation mitigation synergies, right? Uh, we talk a lot about synergies, but often it's also a trade-off. So to really address climate change, uh, there are basically the two strategies, right? Trying to reduce the current emission of carbon from human activities. Uh, and at the same time, we want to try to reduce people's vulnerability. So this is about adaptation. I think it's a very interesting approach, a landscape approach, because it broadened a bit. Uh, there is this discussion about this scale, right? Where uh, our intervention should, should uh, occur. And I think from an adaptation mitigation perspective, it's very interesting scale this landscape because uh, it broadens up a bit the, the actual space to, uh, for our intervention. And from my understanding, it's also helped to include the different stakeholders that, are, uh, that have activities in, in a landscape because there could be winners and there could be losers if we try to implement any uh, activities which are, can have an impact on, on climate change. What does that actually mean on the ground though? I mean, you talk about scale, you talk about livelihoods, you talk about adaptation, which is all, you know, like resilience to climate change. But what does it actually mean? Well, if I went to a, a landscape where we could see these types of projects on the ground, what would I, what would I see? Um, well, you might see a landscape which is uh, very heterogeneous, I would say very multifunctional, uh, if you talk about synergy between adaptation mitigation. Uh, I think a resilient landscape should be one that have different features. It's a mosaic of different structures. You might have different trees, different tree species, a lot of different agricultural species with different crops. Uh, you can have a vertical structure as well as an horizontal structure. Yeah, I think this could be the ideal landscape to, to really address some of the climatic issues that we are facing today. It's interesting because, uh, I mean, the work that we've been doing on landscapes at C4 for almost 20 years is about that, is about that very multifunctionality and you have, you have these complex mosaics of agriculture, forestry, plantations. And so we're not, I think, we're not talking about anything really different. It's a, just a, a way of, a different way of maybe looking through the landscape lens, as it were, um, in terms of climate change. Yeah, I think you're completely right. You're not really reinventing anything, but this like, looking at this uh, issue from a different angle, which actually can, I think can bring interesting perspective and it can really help at least for, uh, uh, for adaptation to be more integrated in mitigation. Uh, very often, uh, and even if you look at the climate finance, like 77% of the climate finance is currently going to mitigation projects. Mm -hmm. Adaptation is uh, lagging behind. And yeah, looking at the landscape and uh, the possible intervention within the landscape could be a way to try to integrate more adaptation into this climate change um, policy discourses. And, and what role does RED and RED Plus play uh, in terms of preserving uh, this multifunctionality of, of landscapes? Yes, so RED has mainly uh, a mitigation strategies. Uh, of course, uh, its main objective is mitigation, but um, it's becoming more and more important, this discussion about the co-benefits that a RED project can bring to local people in terms of improved land tenure, uh, communities benefits, biodiversity, and, and even adaptation. So I see RED as a big opportunity uh, if it's implemented well and uh, it's designed, it's really uh, sound and there are some uh, thoughts and, and, and by involving a lot of stakeholders then RED can be, uh, I think, even an effective instrument to, to help communities to be less vulnerable to the impact of climate change. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point. You mentioned the issue of co-benefits. Some various aspects of C4's research has shown a very nice correlation between biodiversity and biomass. So if I was a, a RED Plus funder, I would want to get those co-benefits, not only for livelihoods, but also for biodiversity. So, you know, co-locate projects where you get the maximum lively benefits but also maximum benefits for biodiversity so that's, a, that's yeah. an interesting point but the red plus mechanism is lagging behind is it not in terms of um, the original expectations in the 
around 2006, 2007 to here we are in 2014, there are very few operational red projects on the ground. Why is that? Yeah, it's a very difficult question. I think, uh, well, maybe there were so many expectations and, and, and the enthusiasm of the early days um, faced difficulties in, in this broad uh, uh, requirements for participations. And, and this actually requires a lot of time, so a lot of people needs to be involved, especially when we talk about mitigation and adaptation synergies. There are different experts working in these different fields and often, you know, they work in, in silos and it's dif even difficult to bring them together. Uh, and, and RED has a very interdisciplinary um, instrument. Then it requires, I think, time and effort from different people, different government agencies to come together and discuss uh, and agree on things that need to be changed in order to, to be ready for RED. Maybe this was a bit underestimated, but I think uh, what uh, has been done in these uh, last years, uh, it's a not a regret option, right? Uh, whatever has been done, it will bring benefits, maybe more in the long term, but we don't see it now. Mm. But I have a question for you about the food security. And sure. yeah, so because in, in, in our work on synergies between adaptation and mitigation, sometimes people say we are forgetting the, the food aspects, which is the basis of climate smart agriculture. How do you see the role of food in, in the climate change? I think even the, the, the phraseology climate smart agriculture is, 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 is quite um, interesting because it implies there's almost a climate stupid agriculture. I think that we underestimate the adaptability of local people in the first place to adapt their agricultural systems to, to change. One of the key aspects of our current food system is that 40 to 60% of the world's food is grown in smallholder diverse systems. And these are much more resilient to climate change than what we consider you know, the, the commercial agricultural systems of uh, monocultures with most of the trees and other natural uh, vegetation removed. And those systems, unfortunately, don't get the support in terms of research support, but also development support because they are smallholder farmers that tend to be relatively poor. Uh, and despite their contribution to the world's food systems, um, they are pretty much out there on their own. And the post-harvest losses are extremely high as well. And there's also a big yield gap. The, the yield gap between what is actually achieved per hectare um, could actually be increased by, by very minimal inputs. So with those sort of development type inputs that you're talking about in terms of fertilizer or um, other products, um, an extension, better seeds, better germplasm, we can actually support these smallholder farmers uh, to produce yet more food and yet exhibit that level of resilience and adaptation that, that we are um, striving for. Okay, maybe Terry, uh, very often we, we, we hear that there is, um, uh, that agriculture and forestry are, are enemies. Uh, and yeah, what do you think about this? Do, do you agree or what can benefit, what forests can get from agri agriculture and what do you... And vice versa. And vice versa. That's a, it's a good question because the, the silo mentality has is, is per pervaded science for the last 30 to 50 years. And I think that's something that C4 as an institution within the CGIR is trying to break down those, those silos and trying to understand the role of forests and agriculture and the interaction between them. As I mentioned earlier, um, much of the world's food is grown in landscapes with trees um, and there is interaction between them. Trees and forests play an incredibly important role as a host for pollinators that play a great role in pollination services of most of our, or many of our crops. Soil stabilisation, watershed protection um, and other ecosystem services that are important for agriculture. And so getting um, Getting people to actually understand that is, is, is critical. We're, we're undertaking a systematic review right now, mm -hmm. looking at exactly that. What is the role of forests and trees in sustaining agriculture? Um, and related to that is uh, the, the direct provisioning of trees and forests. And um, what we used to refer to as non-timber forest products, forest fruits, um, and other um, edible materials, leaves from the forest, do actually play an incredibly important role for nutrition of people living in the proximity of a forest. And so relatively poor people, where our research has shown, have a better diet than people who actually have more money and will tend to buy um, less healthy products 
for their dietary consumption. So that's actually got quite a powerful message that trees and forests not actually not, not just provide ecosystem services to support agriculture, but provide a nutritious source of foods in themselves. So that's, as I say, a, a powerful message that we're taking to the political table to try and get forests and landscapes on the, on the agricultural map. Yeah. And very often, even in our research, we find out that forests and trees can offer a lot of alternatives to the people that are living in disaster prone areas. They are more and more affected by droughts, by the extreme floods, and they can actually rely on, on, on the safety net of forests to, to, to help them with some non-timber forest product or some alternatives to their livelihood that has been disrupted because of... That's exactly right, yeah. I mean, forests play an incredibly important role as a, as a safety net function, particularly in terms of adaptation to climate change, when there are climax, climatic shocks. Um, people rely on, as you say, non-timber forest products and other things from the forest. And mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that role shouldn't be underestimated. Yeah. And even the role that trees and forests are playing before, I mean, in the anticipation of, of uh, a disaster, if we have a healthy ecosystem or a healthy forest protecting a, a steep slopes from, from soil erosions or, or degradation, sometimes we only realize later when the forest is not there anymore that problem might rise, right? And that's why we have to be proactive in our research and not reactive. And that's where I think the comparative advantage of C4 is. We start to predict some of those things before they actually happen so we can mitigate against them.